My name is Jeff Freeman. I'm a uh, research associate in the Center for Humanitarian Health at Johns Hopkins. And basically what I'd like to do is to present uh, a project, a collaborative project, uh, that we uh, have been working on uh, with some, some folks here at Stanford, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Tim Sweeney and, and uh, Dr. Pravesh Khatri, uh, to address the issue of TB diagnostics. Um, so wh what I'm going to do, uh, I can briefly tell you a little bit about what we're doing, but more importantly I want to tell the story of how we put the project together. Um, because I think it's, you know, for anybody who has actually tried to take something from the lab to the field, there are lots of challenges. Um, and so I think it makes for, for an interesting story. So the basic project that we're doing is we're trying to build a bio sample referral program for an austere environment, uh, specifically for the Ifanadine district in Madagascar. Um, which is one of uh, the most uh, austere environments on Earth. Um, and what we want to do by setting up that biosample referral program is we would like to use that occasion to validate a novel uh, tuberculosis diagnostic that was developed uh, here at Stanford um, on uh, dried blood spots. And um, for, the, for those who are not familiar, dried blood spots are uh, a minimally invasive uh, method of uh, blood sample collection where you take a prick of a finger, you place it on filter paper, and you dry it, and then you can use it later for measurement. Um, so how do we get here? So the project kind of began in Baltimore, and at this time it was a collaboration between myself and Dr. Cassidy Rist, who is a professor at uh, Virginia Tech. She's a veterinarian by training. We actually met at CDC when she was in the One Health office. Uh, and I was in the emergency response and recovery branch. Um, and she did her postdoc uh, with the, the NGO that we're working with in Madagascar, uh, Pivot. And specifically, she did her postdoc with their co-founder, Dr. Matt Bonds, who's an economist and an ecologist by training, uh, and another member of their board, uh, Dr. Tom Gillespie, who is an environmental scientist. So at this point, we know we wanted to do dry blood spots. We thought it was useful. It's minimally invasive. You can use them for ambient storage. You don't need a phlebotomist. You don't need cold chain, which is typical in those sorts of areas where maybe you don't have those sorts of resources. But we didn't know what we wanted to use DBS for, and that was like our issue. So we knew the tech, but we weren't sure what the problem was, which is, as many of you know, is like the exact wrong way uh, to go about pursuing a project. But we did that, um, and it didn't work out. Or, early on, but we initially chose arsenic. Why? I'm still not entirely sure, but the justification was there's a lot of rice consumption um, and uh, groundwater consumption, and we thought that it could be an issue. Um, but we weren't sure even if we had that information what you could do with it. But at that time, we were like, this is a good project, we're going to go for it. And we added three people from Johns Hopkins right away. Uh, Drs. Ellen Silbergeld, Paul Strickland, and uh, Tom Kirsch. And Tom's the former director of the Center for Refugee and Disaster Response uh, and is an austere medicine specialist. Paul Strickland is a biomarker expert. And Ellen Silbergeld uh, is an exposure scientist and a MacArthur Genius Award winner for having characterized the effects of lead. And all three of them, we told them about Pivot, why we thought it was a great opportunity. Everybody was like, yeah, we're on board. But at this point, it's just a Hopkins thing. All right. So we submit our letter of inquiry to Pivot. And at this point, we start, the, the LOI gets accepted, and we start working with their research manager, Dr. Andres. Um, and there's, so sorry, so now we've got Hopkins, we got Pivot. So it's a two-team uh, two collaboration. Um, and they say yes to DBS. They like DBS. Like us, they thought there was value there, but they're not so crazy about arsenic. And so the question then was like, well, what do, what, what do you want to do? So they directed us then to their medical director uh, in Ifanadine in Madagascar, uh, Laura. So at this point now the project moves to Ifanadine and we're brainstorming with Laura and trying to figure out what is your, your actual priorities? What does Pivot want done? And what they land on is tuberculosis diagnostics, which are tough, um, as many of you know. Um, but Cass and I are like, yeah, sure, no problem, we got this. Um, but the problem is we don't know anything about TB. So we're not exactly sure what to do, but um, my mentor, Ellen, had told me a couple years ago when I told her I didn't know anything about dry blood spots, just figure it out. So that's what we did. We was like, all right, we're just gonna figure it out. And so we do a little bit of literature review and we eventually find a TB expert over 
uh, in Denmark, uh, this guy, Dr. Morten Ruwal, who had developed a TB diagnostic with the peripheral blood um, with IP10. So we're like, all right, well, let's, let's hit him up. So now the project moves to Denmark and specifically to the Statin Serum Institute. And we tell Morton about Pivot, we tell him why it's so great, why we think this will be wonderful. And he's like, yes, no problem, I'm happy to join. So at this point, we add the Statin Serum Institute. But there's a problem again. You can't actually use his test because you can't prick from your finger and put it on a blood spot. You actually have to take venous blood, you've got to do some prep work to that blood, and then you can spot it on dried blood spots and measure it. So all the simplicity and the advantages that are necessary for an austere environment are lost. But he says there's these folks over at Stanford who I just saw published a paper, and maybe this could be your solution. So we reach out to Stanford. So now the project moves to Stanford University, and we speak with Dr. Tim Sweeney and Dr. Pravesh Khatri, we tell them about Pivot, we tell them what we're trying to do, we very kindly beg them to help us, they very kindly agree, um, and we're off. But there's problems. I'm sorry, I should say. So now we add Stanford. <laughs> but here's the problem, and the problem is essentially twofold. First, their test is with RNA. And RNA is traditionally unstable in, uh, in all matrices for that matter. Um, and so there were questions as to whether or not RNA would be stable enough for dry blood spots. And we didn't know the answer to that question. And then secondarily, their test was validated on liquid venous blood. So it would need to be validated on a DBS matrix. Um, so what we decide then is we're going to reach out to some folks over at Northwestern who have done RNA analysis with dry blood spots. So now we go over to Chicago and we're at Northwestern and we have a discussion with uh, Dr. Bill Funk and Dr. Thomas McDade, two of the world's leading experts in dry blood spots, specifically for the use of DBS in like population-based epi studies. And we, again, we tell them what we're doing. We ask them if they'll join us. They're like, yes, no problem. And now we've got Northwestern. So at this point, we decide we need a lab to actually do this validation. Right? The Northwestern folks use this, but it's not their lab that's doing the testing. They actually send their stuff to UCLA's Social Genomics Corps. And we want to make sure that if we're going to use this test, if, if Tim and Pravesh are going to commit their time, their resources to helping us do this, we want to make sure we give their test the best possible chance to succeed. And so Bill and Tom are like, well, just, just go holler at Steve Cole, the director of the UCLA Social Genomics Corps. So that's exactly what we do. And at this point, the project moves to Los Angeles. And so again, we explain to Steve what we're doing. We tell him why we think this is important. Steve agrees, and now we've got UCLA. So Steve says he'll do the validation test for us and he'll work up a protocol, but we also need to figure out how we're actually gonna get TB cases in Madagascar. And you know, that's kind of an important thing to, to do a, a validation study. Um, and so, Pivot recommends that we reach out to Institute Pasteur, who has a reference lab in the capital city of Madagascar uh, in Antananarivo. So we do that. We reach out to Institute Pasteur, we tell them what we're doing, we ask them if they'll collaborate with us. Pivot actually highly encourages us to bring them in as an equal partner in this thing, and they agree. They say, yeah, you come in, you train us, we'll collect the samples, and we can build out this program. Um, so at this point now, Institute Pasteur has joined the project. But we still have another problem. I'm not a bench scientist by training. Cassidy is not a bench scientist by training. And now we've got to take a protocol that UCLA worked up for us and go train Institute Pasteur staff on that protocol. And we're not equipped to do it. So we decide we're going to reach internal to Virginia Tech and see if we can find somebody who does have that experience who can get that training. And so at this point, we go and talk with Drs. Uh, Claire Sanderson and Kathy Alexander, who are actually in the Wildlife and Fisheries Department uh, of Virginia Tech. And both of them, we tell them about Pivot, we tell them about the three gene signature, we tell them what we're doing, and they're like, yes, totally, we're on board. So now we've added Virginia Tech. So at this point now, uh, Dr. Matt Bonds, Pivot's co-founder, comes to Baltimore to visit. And I'm starting to like freak out because there's a lot of people on this bus, so to speak. Like we went, we've collected a lot of important people, all experts in their own right. They have all freely giving their time and their resources and I'm afraid this is just going to blow up in my face and it's just going to fail. Um, and so Matt very kindly tells me, it doesn't matter if you fail. He said, but it totally matters how you fail. If you fail badly, it's a problem. But if you fail better, it's cool. And maybe you won't ruin your career before it starts. So I'm like, okay, all right, fail better. That's our solution. 
So now Cass and I are in Baltimore and we take this to heart and we're discussing how do we fail better? Because you know, what does that mean? And what we decide or how we're going to fail better is to improve our collection methods, improve our bioanalysis methods, and use both of those to improve our training. So again, we give this project, this test, and this entire effort the best possible chance to succeed. So at this point now, I need to go uh, and, and get a better collection method. And I, as part of my doctoral studies, I've been working on a kit uh, with Dr. David Graham, who's the director of the Center for Resources and Integrative Biology. And I go to David, I explain about Pivot, I explain what we're doing, I explain the three gene test, and I'm like, look, please, can we use these kits? And David's like, yeah, no problem. I got you. You can use the kits. And he asked people on his staff um, to, if they'll help. So Orly, Susan, June, and Suze all get together and they're gonna help us get those kits ready for the field in time for our Madagascar work. So now we have all children's. But we've got the kits, but we haven't stress tested the kits yet. And we don't really have a good way to do it, so we decide we're gonna reach out to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and ask them if they can help us stress test the kits. So at this point now we go and we talk to uh, Dr. Chris Bradburn and Dr. Zara Chaudhry. Chris is a chief scientist at APL, a geneticist by training. Side note, he is also one of the two groups uh, that's working with NASA to sequence microbial life on Mars, which I think is really cool. And Zara is formerly of NASA, but now heads up atmospheric science for the Applied Physics Lab. And they decide they're going to give us an environmental chamber so we can stress test our kits. So we're good there. Um, so now we've got APL. But we have another problem. Chris reminds us that a lab and environmental chamber ain't a rainforest. And ifonidine is a rainforest. So the fact that we've stress tested in the lab doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. We need to do some sort of field simulation. But the National Aquarium in Baltimore has a rainforest. So we're going to reach out to them. So that's what we do. And I reach out to Ken Howe, who's the director of the, the rainforest exhibit at the National Aquarium, tell him about Pivot, tell him about the TB test. He loves it. They get super excited. Their research committee unanimously agrees to let us do the field simulation. They even put like a, like a really cute um, article about what we're trying to do in their like uh, internal newsletter. And so at this point, we have conducted our field simulation and now we've added the National Aquarium. So there's still one more thing. We need to improve our collection methods. Like what's the protocol? How exactly are we doing this so that when these samples get to the point of bioanalysis, we can trust the data that we get. And so we go now back to UCLA and, I'm, and I go to Steve Cole and I'm like, Steve, would you mind running analysis on some methods development work for us so we can test different protocols? He's like, sure, no problem. Just give me some consumables and we're good. So then I go over uh, to all children's hospital and back to David. I'm like, David, will you purchase these consumables for us so that we can run this analysis? Steve's agreed to do the analysis. And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem, but you gotta have to get the primers. So then I go back to Stanford. I go to Pravesh and I'm like, would you mind please giving the primers? Pravesh misunderstands me and he's like, yeah, I'll give you the primers. I'll give you the consumables. I'll pay for everything. And I'm like, no, no, we're good, we're good. We don't need all that. We just need the primers. And he's like, yes, no problem, got you. So we've done all that. So where we stand today, we've got our study design. We've got our partners in place. We've got our kits stress tested. We've done a successful field simulation. We have a protocol selection study scheduled for February. We hit the field in June, backed by all of our partners. Uh, and we thank uh, a good plan that has a good chance for success. And this really just brings me to my point uh, behind telling this story. And that's the process that we took in, in conducting the science of it. And so what was from the very beginning, what was really demanded of us by Pivot is that we zeroed in on an issue of consequence. One that, that, had, that didn't just carry a burden, but carried potential solutions. Um, something that could provide real benefit to the people that Pivot serves. They also encouraged us to seek out innovators in the field. You know, and they gave us the freedom to do that. And they worked with us hand in hand on an iterative development process where Everybody held tight to the principles of intellectual agility like it was a religion. And as we ran into problems, we solved them. If we couldn't solve them, we were encouraged to find someone who could. But at every single point, we just kept moving the ball forward. And this, I think, is important as to why would all of these people be willing to help us? Uh, I mean, 
as I said, all of these people are, are experts in their own right. They're all busy folks, right? And with their own priorities. Um, but I think what everyone recognized is a simple point, and it's just that you need more than good ideas, good science, and collaboration. You need a ground game. You know, if you want to do effective science in the field, if you want to bring something from the lab to the field, you need that ground game. And what Pivot and Center of Albio and the other folks that are there in the field in Madagascar have put together is the intellectual and the infrastructural support. They've put the ground game in place to where folks from the outside, from Stanford, from Hopkins, Northwestern, Tech, UCLA, that they can then come in collaboratively, hit the ground running, and have a successful project. And I think that that is, is to me, a really, really um, important aspect of science, and particularly applied science, translational science. Having said all of that, there's still a chance that this <laughs> fails, right? I mean, that's science. Um, but I think what this process has done for, for us is that if we fail, we will fail fantastically. And to me, like, I, I'm cool with that. And I think Matt's cool with that. And I think Pivot's cool with that. And I think that's really the, the, the point of science. So thank you.